Alors, bonjour, je m'appelle Katia Metz et je suis directrice du Goethe Institut Montréal, l'Institut culturel euh, de l'Allemagne. Et euh, j'ai le plaisir de dire un petit mot de bienvenue euh, à l'occasion de table ronde de VRRV. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first panel of VRRV, a Canadian-German exchange in virtual reality. As a German cultural institute here in Montreal, we strive to create um, platforms for encounters that allow, or platforms that allow encounters between artistic, cultural, and intellectual circuits in Germany and Canada around topics and practices that are equally relevant in both countries. Focusing on the fields of immersive technologies and journalism, the project VRRV aims to bring German and Canadian experts together to set the stage for future collaboration. Through a series of events, we wanted to create the ideal setting for the exchange of knowledge, for networking and co-production, while also rethinking the language and modes by which we engage both with um, VR and with the wider digital world. Together with our part, uh, partner organizations, we invited 25 Canadian and German virtual, crea virtual reality creators, technologists, artists, thinkers and journalists with a high degree of expertise in digital media to work on new concepts for collaborative VR experiences. The, the first workshop session actually started on Monday here at the Fi Center, and the first results of this work in progress will be presented in the following panel. In the beginning of May, the participants will reconvene at Republika in Berlin, Europe's largest and most important conference in the in, or on digital society. Lastly, in November, the at Doc Circuit Montreal RIDM's industry event Participants will gather again to present their co-production prototypes and to follow and to continue the discussion around um, the challenges and opportunities of their work. We are very excited and pleased to realize this project with the financial support of the Federal Foreign Office of Germany and in collaboration with fantastic Canadian and German partner organizations, including Mutec Image, the Publica, the National Film Board of Canada, the Canadian Film Center, Arte Germany, I Steal Film, Mozilla Foundation, Doc Circuit Montreal, Sodec, Retune, and of course our host today, the Fi Center. I would also like to use this opportunity now to really thank all the participants who took some time from their extremely busy schedules to participate in this event and the following one in Berlin. And to participate and join this project with really great, not just great expertise, but also great curiosity and enthusiasm. And I would like to extend my gratitude at the same time, pass the word to Samara Chadwick, who is a filmmaker, curator, and festival programmer who works in Montreal and internationally. Samara curated the VR workshop and um, the workshop and panel series in Montreal and Berlin. And she will also moderate this first panel called Documenting the Digital Society. Welcome, Samara. Thank you. So in like the nature of VRRV, this is a completely spontaneous um, speech, but it's going to be very short. We really want to get to know the groups. Um, the basic premise of VRRV, at least from my angle when I was approached from the Goethe, um, was that there are there's kind of a restricted amount of conversations happening in the field of VR. I've been coming to conferences, um, you know, in places like the Phi Center and around the world and noticing that there are kind of certain patterns that are emerging already in a technology that is so young. And this idea that there were kind of these, these pathways that are going to, they were going to be charted out into, in terms of how the technology was being used and how it was being understood led me to kind of, uh, want to kind of explode those pathways and see what was happening on the kind of the, the peripheries of them. And so um, I also was aware that there are many people that were feeling the same impulse in Montreal um, and, and across Canada. And we also were able to find quite a few in Germany as well. And we invited them all together to kind of chart out this new space. Um, so critically, um, creatively, with, with, with a very deep kind of uh, established skill set um, coming in from five different 
different types of profiles that were brought together on four teams. Um, we just kind of tried to spend the last two and a half days really trying to map out what is possible in VR and also what the conversations um, we could be, we, we should be kind of exploring and developing together, um, not only in VR, but in relationship to technology and to the digital society. So the, it, even in the, the name of VR RV itself, there's this reflection. And so the whole kind of I, the premise of the project was that we were going to kind of build these immersive works that were um, reflecting upon themselves um, and, in, and inviting the user to kind of engage in new forms of reflection on in terms of what they were engaging in. So that's kind of the rough outlines of the project. Um, we all all, we, we carefully curated these 25 people that you're going to meet now that came from all over Canada, all over Germany, um, and even Austria. Um, the, the main thing that we, we were looking for was um, people who were critical, who were creative, who were enthusiastic, and who were interested in collaboration and interested in kind of breaking outside of whatever daily routine they had already established in their field. Um, we built each team around a thinker, um, someone who didn't necessarily have previous VR experience, but was doing very fascinating research in the in kind of the field of digital society, questioning artificial intelligence, big data, the deep web, um, brain computer interfaces. You're going to meet them all. Um, all we knew was that these people were phenomenal. We kind of created, um, we, we, we assembled them in teams. Um, what then happened in the last two and a half days was an organic process. What the presentation that's going to happen now is something that we kind of established somewhat this morning, but it was really um, unclear what was going to happen. And we really wanted to create um, that possibility where the space wasn't predetermined or trying to predict the outcome or trying to predict the works that would emerge. This is not a com competitive project. It doesn't, this is not a pitch, what you're going to see. It's a continuation of a very organic, malleable, um, receptive, open, um, prone to doubt, prone to like re configuration process. And we're going to be doing this thanks to the Goethe Institute and to our partners at Republica and Mutech and RIDM. Um, we're able to do this over seven months, which is phenomenal, is just to allow kind of this fertile space of creativity and collaboration to bring us into spaces that are often not um, permitted when we have the constraints of, um, you know, uh, the market or, you know, uh, a client or the different ways that VR is currently being um, funded or um, commissioned. So that's the rough outline of VRRV. Um, we're going to Berlin in two weeks to continue this conversation. Um, we're so glad to have you guys all here. The projects are really interested in what is happening in Montreal, so please stick around for the cocktail and talk to everybody. Um, they're Obviously, I just said it's not a pitch, but they are still receptive and curious, so if, if a project speaks to you, please, please um, speak to them as well. Um, yeah, that's... Thank you. We have... The projects are also um, framed by incredible mentorship. Mentorship is something that is really, it's a rare thing to come across. Phenomenal mentors, and we have found five. Uh, we have Brett Gaylor of the Mozilla Foundation, who's also a filmmaker, formerly based in Montreal. Um, we have Anna Serrano of the Canadian Film Centre, who's here. Um, we have Sandra Rodriguez of the MIT Open Doc Lab, and the I Steal Creative Reality, I'm not sure what the title is, um, <laughs> lab. Um, we have Louis Richard Tremblay of the National film board and we have Anina Zvetla who's come from Germany with Arte the broadcaster so um, they're all here as well uh, without further ado I'd like to introduce so we began with four projects we now are going to introduce five um, they're all going to give a quick presentation of where they're at um, some will give a quick presentation of what began on Monday morning the thinkers gave a gave a provo provocation so they uh, entered the space presented their their work um, their ideas their data sets like what they were interested in engaging with and then they workshopped um, with their four other team members to try to kind of translate that research into an immersive experience so we're going to begin with Paul Feigefeld um, who's going to talk to us about deep shit so this is the original presentation and then we'll talk about what happened Thanks, guys. Hello. Well, first of all, um, 
Thanks to everyone for having us here. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the people who came with no prior knowledge of VR. I'm a media theorist and historian of technology. And uh, I work a lot with artists too, but I had no, I've never tried VR before. So, but what interested me was that it struck me, it would be a kind of an interesting tool to dig through the deep shit that we're in. Um, because everything's deep recently, you know, there's lots of words that play with this. It's deep learning, it's deep ecology, it's deep time, everything. And then also there's a lot of problems with technology and I think this deep shit is exactly where VR and all other technologies uh, should and do reflect on each other and each other. Um, what I found really interesting when like doing a brief research into VR was that the, the term virtual reality actually comes, uh, we find the first time in 1938 in the work of Antonin Artaud in the theater of cruelty. Um, and uh, in 1968, one of the first contraptions um, built for virtual reality was called the Sword of Damocles. So there's a lot of like weird vocabulary already in there. But can you switch off the music? Oh, that's me actually, I think. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, just give me a second. Okay, well, the, the story of deep shit uh, obviously started in, in the 1990s when Deep Blue um, started beating Gary Kasparov. And there's also something that I find really interesting, that we start building technologies in a way that, that they take all the fun away from us, you know? Like, games used to be fun, but now we build um, technologies that beat us. There's only one person, the guy in the middle, who obviously really likes it. He's like, yes. Uh, and, and this, of course, also brings with it a certain distance to technology. The depth is also something that is not only leads to a, a pretends to have a deep understanding, but it also puts a distance between us and technology. This is why we speak of the black box. Um, the black box, which also becomes a fetish object for for uh, tech, tech bros, in a way. Um, the black box, as you know, is a concept of sort of, you know, you build, a, you build a box and you can put something in and you, something comes out, but you don't really know what's going on in between, which I think happens today in a, in a, on a much more massive scale in the age of cloud computing, which is this misleading um, metaphor of something that's sort of ephemeral or, or fluffy or white and decentralized, while it, actually it's sort of a smoke bomb, um, which hides a massive hegemonial data centralization campaign um, and our devices become smaller and smaller and more transparent which means that the, the black box actually um, sort of has fulfilled itself and becomes perfect because it's not even the rabbit that the, disappears into the hat there's no hat anymore you know the whole thing is just gone so the black box is perfect um, this of course has a history also rooted in in science fiction this sort of uh, black box thing, um, which you can find. Then, of course, we have Deep Space Nine. Um, so for a while, uh, everything is kind of still nice and still something that, that's worth exploring. That's the final frontier. Um, and um, quite recently, we've uh, come up with a lot of different other concepts that somehow pretend to be deep in some way or the other. Um, deep neural networks, you've heard of them. Uh, they do everything at the moment. Um, nobody really understands what they do. That's the thing about them that sort of, it feels like going fishing, you know? You sort of throw out the fishing line and then something, you pull up something, but you don't really know how you got there. That's the, that's the thing that troubled the people at Google DeepMind so much when uh, quite a while ago, you've heard about it probably, um, Lee Sedol, this Korean grandmaster in chess, got beat by Google's uh, AlphaGo software. And um, the press reported about it and said that it was sort of unexpected. He was, um, he was so taken aback by the moves that the software was doing that we sort of thought that it's somehow deep and it has human intuition or something like this, which of course is not true. It just simply played probably it's like a couple billion more games of Go than, uh, than any human player had before. So it's a question of experience. This was, it was a national tragedy in, in Korea. So um, there, were, there were reports of mass drinking and sort of you know, collective depression um, after this happened. And uh, the day after, the Korean government poured like $1 billion into AI research. So it was also a campaign, you know, like we beat them and we, we take the fun away from them and then they'll give us money. 
AlphaGo Zero then um, started to do that, uh, the same thing on, on an unprecedented scale by, by doing actually not training on, on different uh, games, but actually learning how to play itself. Um, then, of course, there are all these oceanic metaphors that uh, are connected to the internet, um, the deep web uh, and all of this, which I think is also interesting because there are a lot of parallels between the ocean and the high seas and the deep ocean and, uh, and the deep web. Also, when it comes to the question of um, both the ocean and the web as a legal space. So you could say that digital rights at the moment and the question of regulation uh, are about on the same level as maritime law was in the 18th and 19th century. So basically, there are some companies like Alphabet or in the 18th century, the East India Company, who build the infrastructure, who do the trade and everything and basically dictate the law also. Also, it really like, I think politics very often behaves like the internet is somewhere out there, you know, and we're not really connected to it. You can go on the internet and then maybe it sort of has something to do with you, but um, it's untouchable in a way. But there are all these metaphors about the deep web. We usually use these iceberg models about the surface web, the visible web, the deep web and the dark web. The dark web also a very, very wrong metaphor because nothing is dark on the dark net except maybe some of the content in its way. But um, it's... Uh, Everything is visible, you know? The dark web is actually the place where there's no filter at all. So this is, I think we have to think about this, these sort of visualizing concepts because this is also something that interests me on, about VR, not so much as a visual concept, but um, also as, as, a, as a cognitive concept per se because I think we're very much too much thinking visually all the time. Um, iceberg model also, of course, always used to describe the psyche of the Western man since Freud. Then there's a concept called deep ecology, which has to do with, like, leads straight into cybernetics and the idea of connected ecosystems and technological systems and cultural systems. Um, the term coined by Arne Nies in 1973, I just really like this picture. And, um, yeah. I recently started working for an art foundation. Um, they have a scientific project called the TBA 21 Academy, where we are concerned with the deep ocean mostly, and we um, travel around on an expedition ship called the Dardanella and go to the uh, Pacific and bring artists and scientists and technologists and um, try to work on the way, like develop new methods on how to deal with all the knowledge that we can gather from the deep. This all leads into a project called the Ocean Archive, which is a big relational database that I'm currently working on. One of the topics that concerns us is um, deep sea mining, which is something that is currently not really being done uh, yet. But um, if all the laws go through, then uh, next year, a company called Nautilus, which of course is the submarine of uh, Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. So there's another sci-fi um, metaphorology in it, um, they will start dredging up the ocean floor, which uh, they do with the argument that it's better than going um, resource mining in the Congo, for example, because there are no humans to be bothered or to be suppressed on the ocean floor. The problem being that there are ecosystems down there that have been untouched for a couple of billion years. So um, there are sediments and everything. So we really don't know what's going to happen when we start dredging up the ocean floors with gigantic machines looking for um, these little um, pebbles called uh, nodules of manganese. They contain an insane amount of rare earth minerals uh, worth approximately 150 trillion, if the calculations at the moment are correct. So given that there is a lot of money involved, there's probably not much we can do to keep them from doing this. Um, this is the company that you should have a look at. This, of course, um, then there's also the concept of deep time. And um, Facebook has a deep face software, which is better at recognizing faces than any human can ever be. Um, and then since a couple of years, we've been also being confronted with the idea of um, the deep state. So this was sort of the starting point for our workshop on Monday deep shit and um what we did then because there's a lot of different concepts as you can see and i kind of hurried through now i was even i think seven minutes faster than on monday 
Um, so uh, it was quite confusing. It was kind of hard to see how we could reduce all this down to um, a little easier uh, and, and better understandable concept. And we came up with something. I'm, I'm very happy with how it turned out, actually. And I would like to ask uh, Sam to come up on stage um, because we came up, we were a group of uh, five people and we came up with a concept called The Deep. Hello? Yeah. I'm also quite happy with how this turned out, actually. Because at first we were kind of, it was a bit messy, but you know, we sort of pulled it through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to turn on the music again now because it sounds nice. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to read the pitch that we came up with. The problem is that now I can't, OK. We, we, yeah, we, we got in too deep with all too many concepts. The deep is a realm of the real the imaginary and the symbolic. Life starts in the deep. Life, however, is not only biological. Cultures, techniques, technologi technologies evolve, emerge, and create with us. The deep produces ideas, imaginations, and concepts of great depth. Deep learning, deep time, deep ecology, deep sea mining, all of which are hard to grasp, experience, and explain. So instead of illuminating the darkness of the abyss, instead of extracting, harvesting, colonizing, or destroying, the deep explores from within. We are sentimental sediments, fickle fossils, trace elements, rare minerals, abstract actors, extremophiles, data plankton, software crabs, thermal hardware, fiber optical fishing nets, surveillance barnacles, currents of knowledge, and waves of non-knowledge. The deep is a circular, palindromic, cybernetic lagoon of stories and concepts. You can dive in at any point. There is no beginning and no end. The deep core circle leaps into outer loops, eventually creating and connecting more and more entities of knowledge and experience. But this is the basic ecosystem of deep terms that we came up uh, with. And you can basically really see it as a, as a cycle. And you can step in at any point and go back and forth. And they're all sort of interconnected if everything works out as, out as planned. So what we did is we came up with one um, sort of example narrative that we could imagine because the idea was not to tell a story or to go in as a human observer and as an explorer but to become an entity that's, ex that's being explored. So the first thing that we thought of would be nice is in the deep ocean you can actually be a rock. One of these manganese nodules. So be a rock at the bottom of the ocean, miles deep. Everything is nice and chill. You have moved 10 centimeters over the past 2 billion years comfortably cradled into the immense pressure and abysmal darkness, surrounded by friends. They're rocks too. Suddenly seismic shocks move through you, eon-old sediments explode into a kilometers high mushroom cloud and as the brightly lit juggernauts of a mining company dredge and grind everything to ashes. You get sucked up, the pressure changes, as do you. You become data dust, disassembled into rare elements, and soon enough a Chinese worker assembles you into a smartphone and faster than you could ever imagine, you open your eyes as you look into the face of a millennial and are doomed to do selfies and run loops of deep learning facial recognition algorithms for Instagram for what for you is only the blink of an eye, yet for the device is a whole life cycle. So we came up with this idea of having little entities and now Sam is going to say a little bit of how he imagined these other sen sentimental sediments and rocks and whatever we see. Oh yeah, so I'm Sam, Samuel Walker. Um, so I'm an artist, uh, and I've been working uh, in VR since 2014. Um, yeah, I actually, I, mean, we're, I was going to come and talk a little bit about these entities, but then, you know, hearing all this, I, just, I'm, I feel like this entire session of thinking about these ideas in a collaborative platform, it just, I constantly want to change what I'm talking about or change what I'm thinking. So suddenly I just kind of, I just scrawled these notes like pretty furiously and I actually just don't even really want to talk about this anymore, uh, about this specifically. But no, there's a lot of like really interesting stuff in these, um, these like, concepts of the deep, a lot of like paradoxical concepts. And one of the things that we enjoyed was uh, the idea of um, sort of a hybrid between plastic um, and biological organisms. And we look at like the bottom of the ocean as being these deeply, or this deeply symbolic space full of these um, pretty rich symbols that we're familiar with and it's you know represents the, uh, the the deep subconscious the sort of and and all the ideas that we have of these you know really 
mysterious creatures that we see in the, uh, what's that documentary? Uh, not Planet Earth, but Deep Blue, I think, is a new thing. We see these, you know, jellyfish. They're otherworldly, they're alien, they're bizarre. And so it's, a, it's almost a great representation of, uh, of, um, of what's to come in the future and sort of what we're imagining collectively, uh, which is something we're more familiar with now, I think, with, you know, these science fiction concepts that we didn't really... Uh, didn't feel comfortable with all these dystopias, but now they're sort of public consciousness with 2001 Space Odyssey, the AI AlphaGo beating the uh, chess player. You know, there's a sense of disappointment, but like no big surprise. We're all expecting the singularity, yada, yada, yada. But um, a bit about sort of these, these entities though. Um, I think what, what, uh, what, I'm, what, I've, what I've got in my head a little bit is, is a sort of mishmash between some of these deep, deep organisms and uh, sort of like mixed with, uh, you know, some of the ecological crisis images that we see with plastics, or, you know, suffocating a turtle or something. Um, so like something kind of problematic like that, but also mixing in media. So there's, you know, they're made of video textures or they're made of data points. And so everything's sort of culminating in this like, you know, synthesis of... of uh, uh, technological, cultural, uh, and, uh, and biological. So yeah, sort of the singularity of our time, I guess. I don't know. And on and on and on. We're still trying to figure this out and it's a great deal of fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just to, I guess, mention just who else was on your team. We had um, Nicolas Roy from DPT. Uh, we had Catherine Damour from Nouvelle Administration. And we had Philippe Steinfatt from VR Nerds uh, in Hamburg. So this next presentation um, is uh, what emerged from a presentation that was given by Tess Takahashi, who's a scholar based in Toronto. She's not here today. She'll be back tomorrow um, there's a panel happening tomorrow um, at, I think, 11-ish uh, called Stories We Sell. Um, so you can meet Tess there. She's an independent uh, scholar who writes and programs experimental media, documentary film, and art installation. Um, she is currently finishing a book called Documentary Encounters with Big Data. And so her um, talk on Monday was kind of about... Uh, the, how documentary and analog uh, spaces can also translate into some form of big data. Uh, but this is what um, actually emerged, and I'll let her team members uh, talk about their process. So actually, I'll, so this is Charlene Bouta <laughs> and Naila Inuksuk. Hey, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Charlene Boutin. Uh, I'm a game designer at Casavara Studio. So we make VR games and other types of games, but mostly uh, VR experiences. And hi, guys. My name is Nyla Inukshuk, and I am a producer of VR 360 AR content. And so together we were working with um, uh, Tess, who's, as it was mentioned, is part of our group, but had to kind of step away for the day. Um, so although she's there are resident thinker. Um, we will try to do our best. Um, so this, uh, what we've come up with is, is a game and we wanted to really play with the role of sound in virtual reality and make it the most important component in grounding the viewer in the space using ambisonic sound and 360 sound design. So our game, um, which right now is called Pierce the Darkness, allows you to imagine that you're in a dark space. And so kind of looking around you, um, you're able to see that you're in a tunnel, but really very uh, little else visually. And that you are in the maze, and your goal is to find your friend who is also somewhere in the maze. And... The, but you're not alone. There's actually a monster that's existing somewhere inside there um, along with you. And its goal is essentially to find you and engulf you in complete darkness. So this is a two-player game that involves cooperation to avoid the looming threat um, within a time constraint. 
And so the idea uh, of this experience is to combine uh, two people uh, within the same virtual space. Uh, they would have two different uh, physical spaces and to also give them different, uh, different perceptual abilities uh, so that in order to find their way out of the darkness uh, and away from the threat, they have to communicate what they can perceive uh, whether that perception is uh, visual or auditory or haptic feedback, um, they can have different ways of seeing those things. So uh, a concrete example that I could give you is uh, one of the players could have um, could have heat heat wave uh, vision, so could be able to better see in the dark. Uh, another could have reduced hearing, for example. So in this case, uh, if one has better hearing and one has better um, has better sight, uh, only by combining and speaking to each other and combining this information can they possibly, uh, you know, manage to find each other in this darkness and triumph. So what we're kind of playing with is this kind of concept of sound being represented as light. So when you're kind of first um, in the experience, what you'll be able to figure out is that by making a noise, so such as like snapping your finger, that will actually spark a light and help guide you within where you're going. But the kind of the, the problem with that is that the monster, it's actually attracted to sound. So while you want to be using uh, as sound as much as possible to kind of find your way within the maze and find each other, uh, you have to be really careful about how you balance it because if you're making too much sound, the monster will be able to fast find you very quickly. And then, um, so it's kind of uh, a matter of kind of using that in a kind of a clever way and really relying on your sense of um, of perception when it comes to sound because our monster will have a very distinctive sound. And when you're in a space, um, you'll find that, that audio is really, really important. And so kind of gauging, uh, where you are within a space, really kind of relying on your, on your sense of sound is going to be something that's, uh, really crucial. Sorry. There we go. And so this is kind of an example of, uh, of sound uh, representing light and how it's going to be important visually and just kind of getting glimmers of, um, of visuals through, through your use of sound. And there we go. This is kind of um, an imagining of what our creature might look like. And essentially, it's this creature that we wanted to be terrifying enough, but really represent um, the darkness and its kind of goal in really like the absence of light. Um, and so essentially, it kind of roams throughout the maze in search of any light to, to snuff out. And that includes uh, the players. And so it's essentially kind of attracted to any sound that you may make. So it um, can be used as a strategy for players because while you can make sound yourself um, by just snapping your fingers, you can also do things like pick up rocks and, and use that as distraction. And we wanted to, to find something that was, um, you know, terrifying, but also not something that would be absolutely traumatic to, to players because we are sensitive to the, the idea that we want this to be, um, some, uh, it's almost existing in your peripheral. So it's um, something that kind of moves radically and that's, that's the kind of the way that we can create it um, as being this terrifying creature. But if you get caught, essentially it's this, um, this absence of light that takes over. Oh no. Uh, uh, so there's a few things that we started to have to consider when we, you know, when we started brainstorming. Like, so this is going to be a, like very a very gamified experience. Uh, one of the things is that, um, like, you know, having an experience in VR allows you to do things that traditional games don't allow you to do. Uh, for example, like having having players being really 
uh, completely immersed in the space. The, so this is what allows us to play with the senses a lot and you know make make them be part of um, the main experience. And so like sound is both a tool and uh, and a visual cue uh, that allows you to move and it, that is also a threat to you. Um, and so because you have to navigate this virtual space, uh, something that comes up often in VR is the issue of movement itself. Uh, so in our case, uh, we were looking at something like the HTC Vive, which, um, which basically allows you to build a, a real room scale virtual room. So for example, uh, a three by three meter space uh, in front of your computer. And so you know you can you can walk around the space uh, without any problems. But then what happens if you want to have, for example, in our case, we have two players trying to find each other. So we have to we need a space that is bigger than that. Uh, so the issue of movement comes up because you want to know how will the player move from that little three by three square to another three by three square. Uh, and so the uh, the idea came up of you know the the, the feeling of crawling through the dark. Uh, so that's what the players are trying to do here. They're trying to crawl their way into the light to their friend. And so uh, this natural movement of having two controllers in your hands and, you know, crawling, and now it's hard to do with the microphone, but, you know, crawling your way uh, into this maze, uh, it works really well. Uh, oh, no, did we lose visuals? So, it, yeah, it works really well uh, naturally because, you know, when you want to crawl yourself out of, uh, out of somewhere, you're you know, you're naturally going to start doing this. And so we really want to play with that aspect of, you know, moving the controllers and seeing how we could, like, naturally, organically move the player in that way. Uh, we, also, uh, we also have to consider everything uh, that goes into feedback. So if you're going to play with the senses a lot uh, and if you're going to trap the player in this dark space, uh, you need to make sure that they, they kind of understand what they need to do and they know where they're going. So, um, you know, we really thought of, you know, we need to have uh, not only audio uh, feedback and visual feedback, but also haptic feedback as well. So vi using vibrations uh, in the controllers to kind of guide the player to where they need to go. Um, we also have this idea of the sound residue uh, that you kind of already talked about a bit. Um, now this basically, um, if, you can if you can visualize um, the trace that a smell would make. Uh, so, for example, if you're like a if if a dog is trying to you know sniff somebody out, like smells will have uh, they have they have like a, a quality in time. So basically, you know, like if something has been here for a long time, the scent is not as present. So we want to try the same thing, but with sound. And sound, since it's a visual idea in this project, it would be like a visual residue. Uh, that can allow you to to determine how long something has has passed here, uh, how long ago, or not. So this is like a big feedback that we want to use uh, for the two players to be able to find each other. Uh, and oh, um, also, uh, so basically the um, the basic rhythm of this game uh, would be that like once you're in the space, you have a certain amount of time before. Uh, before time runs out, and you have to, uh, like, basically the sun comes up and it's too late for you. And you know you've lost, wait, sorry. You know you've lost when you can't pierce the darkness, but you know you've won when you find each other and your two hearts light up in harmony. Anything else to add? Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the next team is actually going to come up with the whole team, so you get a sense of the constellation. Um, I think I'll just introduce Christiana Mietke, who's um, the thinker in this team, and you can introduce everyone else. So this is, um, Christiana is an independent uh, filmmaker slash journalist. Um, she was here uh, at our IDM a year and a half, or a year and a half ago. Her project was here with the Do Not Track, which she did in partnership with um, Bayerische Rundfunk, which uh, she was working with a uh, broadcaster in Germany, as well as Arte, who's also here, and the NFB, a uh, bunch of other pe people. But um, yeah, thanks for being here, Christiana. Thank you very much. I'm glad I can be here. 
So are we ready? So we're going to uh, um, introduce to you a project called Mindfuck. I hope you're ready. So kind of the idea of the research I came into this space here was something I'm working on probably going to do a documentary about it, so this was my first idea, starting with this guy last year, uh, asking this question, what if you could type directly from your brain? So this kind of got me interested in, so what is actually happening here? And I realized there are so many companies, especially in Silicon Valley, trying really to find ideas to do research, how to get, in onto, how to get into our brains. They do this with different methods. I'm not going to talk, go too deep into it, but I really realized, okay, there's something going on. There's really this next step of, of kind of invasion of privacy that's going on that includes our biodata. So it's not only our brain, it's also like our pulse, our emotional expression, our faces, all these kind of things that we kind of, um, that really tell so much more about, about ourselves than all the data that's already out there. So with this kind of, very kind of rough idea what, how could that translate into VR. I'm very happy that I had a like, really wonderful team. I'm sorry. Really wonderful team here. I want to just briefly introduce to you. This is Egbert Weingarten. This is Christian. I don't remember your name. <laughs> Junke. Tali Goldstein and Alison Moore. And then we got a new member, Johannes, who was our, uh, kind of added to our team the musical aspect, which is very important to us. So I just going to very briefly introduce the idea to you and I would like you to all close your eyes now. So you're entering this very nice space. It's very it's round and you realize that the music is going in the rhythm of your body rhythm. You can kind of open and close it with your breathing. And then this voice starts talking to you. Ask you to relax. And you realize that the colors and also the music is answering to your, the brain waves that you are giving. So it's getting slowly. And then maybe you get excited about this. And then all of a sudden, this is, you get the immediate reaction of the colors and the sound. So this will go on for a while. And I'm not going too much into detail because we love the story that we came up so much that we're not going to spoil it. So you can all open your eyes again. But what's going to happen then will not only stay in this meditative, really nice way. It's going to get pretty scary and really introduce this idea of both ways of this technology can go. So there's this dream. We can really kind of maybe control the world with our mind. But there's also this very, very scary part of that we're going to sign off our privacy completely. So with this project, we also, because I really deeply feel this is important that we talk about this, especially now, um, where there's probably still time, um, because there are no really laws or like protection that are really in place. And with all this other privacy stuff that we've probably somehow I feel like we are already too late. But with this kind of we can we still have the time to talk about it publicly and maybe kind of introduce the institutions or the laws to, to protect ourselves a little bit better. So um, I would like now That is right. I want to. <laughs> I'm gonna. Um, so we had this luck that we could talk. Uh, we could work with Johannes because he's already done something on this project, and I now want to kind of hand over to you to explain a little bit the music part. Hi, um, Johannes Hellberger from Kling Klang Klang in Berlin, and uh, I'm your brainwave DJ today. <laughs> um, actually, I made this in 2012 with uh, Neuro kind of device which doesn't exist anymore so I couldn't find any drivers so I tried to fake it right now but yeah I was really happy that actually I could join this group right here who's working on this great project with neuroscience so to give you a little insight so from what I um, tested on uh, was that what we get as data from the brain something very principal is you get different wavelengths, like uh, big wavelengths, which is a more meditative part of, of what happens in your brain, and these small, quick wavelengths, which is more what happens when you consciously think or, or you agitate it. And then we talked about it to 
put yourself in a room where the sound and the colors, everything is connected to these frequencies, that in the end you feel a very direct feedback of the space you're in. And when I gave this little prototype patch, what you just heard here, to people, they put it on and they heard this and then they recognized some changes and then they recognized, oh fuck, it's working. And that moment when they said, oh shit, it's working, that made them agitated and the whole thing went super crazy. I don't know. And that made them even more agitated. So for me, that was a proof of concept that the whole thing you know, the brain feedback and then understanding that it works and that you have control over the music through your brain already puts you in that feedback loop of this powerful being. Yeah, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun and maybe a great experience. Yes, and this is what I actually really want to kind of say. This was a lot of fun and I, like, it was a really incredible kind of rhythm that we had in the team. It was really... Um, at, when I first came in here, I was like, okay, this is two days. <laughs> we have like, we have two days to get from a very rough idea. And we were specifically asked not to kind of really think about before what we want to do in VR, but really leave it open. I was like, no way we're going to come out with something. And all of a sudden, you know, thanks to this team and probably also thanks to the restricted time, we kind of got to an idea that we now feel ready to start prototyping soon. The process for us was very amazing because everybody in this group was somehow very connected to the idea of mind control or taught policing or a loss of privacy. So it came from a very personal point for everybody and we had a great synergy and I think we went way further than we expected ourselves. So we are very excited to keep uh, doing this work and prototype it in Berlin and uh, as well uh, maybe make this a real project. Uh, one of the interesting things that I personally loved uh, about this concept is that we can use the retro feedback that Johannes was talking about, uh, to put, use your waves as an input, use your body, use your, uh, use your feedback, your biofeedback as input, but as well, we will have the power of twisting it and taking control back. And uh, I think this is a very interesting avenue to explore in the world that we're living now. Um, we will love to talk more about privacy, brain control, thought control uh, with you guys. Uh, so we're pretty fun and we don't bite, as Chris says. So come talk to us and we might explain a little bit more of the project. Uh, thank you. And uh, it has been a blast working with you, with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this is uh, the breakout group. Um, this happened like yesterday, no? So um, this is Christian Kokot and Mate Steinfoth, um, both in Berlin. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Christian. I will just talk as long as he's connecting his laptop. Um, my name is Christian, we're both from Berlin, I think Matt is going to introduce himself. Um, yeah, the moment we kind of got together in a group, we seem to have both kind of a love for the clarity of mind and meditation. And we talked a lot about, I don't know, um, distraction and this kind of stuff. And we decided that, um, that the topic we're going to tackle now is what's most interesting to us. Yeah, so, hey guys, what you're seeing here is a rat in a, in a cage, and it was put there by uh, B.F. Skinner, and I'm, I'm just going to ask you, who of you knows the concept of the Skinner box? Some of you, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So that's basically an experiment where they put the rat in a cage, and then once it hits the button, it gets a reward. Now, when it doesn't get a reward, uh, if it hits the button, then after a while it gets disinterested and stops hitting the button. If it does get a reward uh, by hitting the button, then it learns that behavior and keeps hitting the button to get his food. The interesting thing is that once it sometimes gets the food if it hits the button and sometimes it doesn't get anything, it becomes even more interested in the button. Uh, 
So that's kind of counterintuitive, but that's how it works, and apparently also in, in human. So um, big rewards that come at unpredictable times trigger dopamine releases uh, that are bigger than, you know, you, you know the reward uh, coming. And that's the same mechanics in which, uh, you know, we have to Gambling, in which gambling, uh, that's exactly how gambling works. And uh, apparently it's also exactly how social media works because Instagram is holding some likes back so, and gives it to you in a burst so that you get a higher dopamine response. So it makes you more addicted to the service. And that's a, a, a really an issue because the average user engages with its, his or her cell phone uh, a, a lot of times per day. So we are all cell phone addicts and uh, the bad thing about it is that it actually makes us feel worse and that's also something which you know has been shown in studies so how do we approach uh, that uh, theme so that was kind of like the starting point of our um, discussion and um, uh, yes keeping with the idea of uh, Instagram or like social media being like a, a gambling addiction which it really is so how do we focus our attention to get away from this distraction we have all the time and um, obviously um, one thing you could do is to start uh, meditating right or to start being more aware of yourself and so this is a topic we kind of like a question set try to tackle and there are already a couple of approaches for that in the digital space so for example there's an app um uh yeah we found sorry i skipped that joke ah fuck that one up uh uh there's uh, there are those animated gifs um which you can find online which uh, tell you to breathe in and breathe out slowly according to the animation you're seeing. And that is actually working. So if you feel anxiety or if you feel maybe, I don't know, lonely or scared or something like that, that's actually helping people. And you, and you see that in the comments also on the internet that that actually works. And um, there are also uh, apps like uh, Headspace, for example, which is uh, guided meditation. Um, and we, we shared our personal experience with that is that it, that didn't really work for us that well. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's again, it's on the same gambling device. So it's, it's like basically, you know, trying to get sober with a fridge full of liquor or something like that. But um, uh, another reason why it didn't really work for us that well is that you're still in the same environment with your cell phone, right? And it, it's harder to concentrate, and also you're on your own. So that means that uh, if you if you feel that you just want to stop the meditation because you you know it's too boring, maybe it's, so you 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 could just skip ahead or switch the device off or whatever. So um, uh, those are two things that are actually solved by VR, and that's why we think that a guided meditation in VR is a very, very interesting approach, even though VR is also a technology, so it's not like getting away from technology, but it, it could be like a positive uh, entry um, to that. So um, the one thing which is interesting is that you're completely immersed in that world in VR, and the other thing which we found really interesting is that you could potentially... Um, not do that by yourself, but do a meditation with someone else. So in that way, you know, you feel responsible for the experience of this other person who is connected to you. Now, again, there are also already uh, social um, spaces in VR that lets people interact, like uh, Altspace VR that I have here. But those spaces have the same issues uh, if you look at just kind of randomly uh, pairing up people on the internet without VR. Uh, mainly, this is uh, one of the issues. What happens if you get just paired up with someone just like on chat roulette? So they can really fuck up your experience if, if you're after like a meditative state. So what we're proposing is um, uh, to also not necessarily go in a, an aesthetic direction, which you see here. So there are also apps in VR that do guided meditation, but they look quite cheesy. Uh, this is a personal, you know, or personal uh, perception. But um, we really want to kind of combine all those insights or all those thoughts into something we call... Um, jokingly, body presence, because we feel that it's really about the presence of, uh, of, a, of a body. Um, so, you know, body in a, in a virtual space. And um, that means if you have um, two people sharing the same virtual space together, 
um, uh, that you can see an avatar actually being there physically with you in this virtual space. Um, it incentivizes you again to stick with the meditation because you don't feel you're on your own, but at the same time, it, it doesn't give a chance to that other person to kind of like fuck up your experience. And uh, the good thing in VR, which is a very interesting uh, thing to explore, is that because you have the headset which is tracked and you have the um, you know motion controllers which are tracked, you can actually um, really feel the motion of someone in that same space, and you can really actually feel uh, the the em emotion also of someone using that. So if you look at um, an example for that, real quick, is that. Um, if you look at this, what you see is just a bunch of points, right? So I mean, this is a 3D space, so I can move around. Uh, but still, it's quite um, abstract what that is. Yet, if you start moving, then you can very clearly see this is human motion. And not only that, but you can also feel, is this person happy? Is this person sad? And stuff like that. So even though this is an abstract representation of someone, it's still a very, very bodily perception so and and that's what we're proposing so we're basically saying well let's do a multiplayer um vr a meditation or you know body presence um app in which we have a like you see here also just a very reduced aesthetics so kind of like an abstract space and um which should be also um like we see here also procedurally generated so that is also an idea we kind of want to play with so that your um meditation actually informs the space in which you're in so basically you know however good you at it you would you would change your environment and it could also be interesting to play with something where you have your uh, meditation experience you know, changing the environment of the other person involved in it. Uh, all right, so this uh, was essentially our um, thought process in the short time we had, um, which actually was really short because we just started yesterday. But apart from that, it's uh, definitely, uh, we feel, uh, a relevant topic and it's very interesting for us to explore that. And because we know that there are also VR creators here in the audience, like if you are interested in similar themes or if you just want to chat, like we're both from Berlin, if you just want to get to know us or whatever, come come meet us if you, if you like. And um, yes, thank you. Yeah, I highly recommend you look both of them up. Um, just in terms of their websites and their resumes. Very impressive. Yeah, so thanks for being here, guys. So uh, this is the last presentation. Um, uh, I also want to just let you know that we've allotted a lot of space for questions, so all of the thinkers or one member from each team will come up at the end and we'll answer any questions you have, so we invite you to start thinking about them already. Uh, I want to introduce Liam Maloney, who's a visual journalist uh, based in Toronto, originally from Montreal. Liam did um, was a participant in the kind of original prototype of this of the VR RV, which was the Kino VR, a three day uh, VR lab that we did during the RIDM in November 2016. Um, and uh, we invited him back uh, as a journalist to kind of introduce his ideas. Uh, to the group, so he was one of the lead thinkers, and I'll let Liam take it from there. Yeah? Um, I'm very happy to be here. This, uh, this marks the first foray into virtual reality for me um, on a serious issue. Uh, I've done experiments in the past, but um, this project was born out of my experiences working in the Middle East. Uh, for the last four years, I've been trying to find novel um, or innovative approaches to reporting on the conflict in Syria, which, um, as you all know, is marching on into its eighth year uh, with no end in sight. And the coverage is starting to look remarkably homogenous. Um, one picture of a refugee looks just like another. And I feel like people are starting to drown in this sea of images that, that are losing meaning. Um, it's also become remarkably difficult to work inside Syria. And a lot of um, what we know as journalists comes from citizen journalists who are reporting on the ground very courageously using smartphones um, and uh, small digital cameras. 
So I started looking at this footage uh, with a more critical eye. And, um, you know, there are millions of videos out there, literally millions of videos recorded by citizens over the past eight years. And very few of them have penetrated the public consciousness. Um, and why is that? Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to know why. Um, the material is gruesome. The videos are shaky, they're handheld, the videos are uploaded at very high compression ratios, so um, it's kind of hard to make out what's going on. Uh, they're often shot in the aftermath of bombing attacks when there's this sort of thick dust um, suffusing the air and you can barely see anything. Um, you can hear people screaming, you can hear, uh, you know, sirens. Um, it's, it's devastating to watch, and, and I don't really blame the public for not engaging with this material. Um, but uh, this does offer conclusive evidence of human rights violations that are occurring on a daily basis. Um, so I think it's, it's extremely important that we engage with this material somehow. So the challenge for me was to find a way to um, bring viewers closer to this material, closer to this user-generated content um, without exposing them to the trauma and the horror of the visuals um, that sadly we've all become sort of immune to. Um, what we did is we, we started talking about this stuff as a group um, myself, Sonke, Vlad, Claire, and uh, Johannes, as well as, as uh, the mentors here. And we, we made these word clouds. Um, basically wrote down everything that we thought might be associated with this project. And uh, tried to find, not a light bulb exactly, but more like a lightning bolt out of this cloud that could guide us towards a, an immersive project that would actually engage people. So I'll just read through some of these. Um, we've got human rights violations, journeys, constellations, physiology, metadata, archives, projectiles, biorhythms, smartphones, streams, the democratization of information, nobody's listening, neural networks, shell shock, connections, Syria, motion tracking, user generated content, fireflies, darkness, combating Western indifference, Suppression, drowning, loss, haze, dust, numbness, interactivity, forensic data analysis, evidence, ephemeral data, reactive audio, the gesture of witnessing, the economy of attention, algorithmic censorship, traces and fragments of audio. Um, and I went home and thought about all these words and how we could assemble them into something coherent. And I thought about a project I'd done in Berlin a couple years ago with a Syrian-born artist who grew up in Damascus. His father was a famous political cartoonist and um, had been imprisoned by the, the uh, Assad regime, by Hafez Assad, uh, Bashar's father. Um, anyways, when the war broke out, he and his wife Lama fled Damascus and uh, sought asylum in Germany and settled in Berlin where he lives and works as an artist now. And we did this project um, where I would go over to his house early in the morning while he was still sleeping. And uh, I'd wait till he woke up and I'd take a picture of him as he woke up. And then I'd ask him to draw his dreams um, because he was this very compulsive sketcher. And over the course of a week, we filled this sketchbook with these dreams and these memories and these fragments of the subconscious, and, and you could really see the influence that the war had had on him. And one of the recurring themes um, was, was this sort of olive grove. I, I think that trees marked for him uh, his sense of place, and he felt deeply uprooted by the conflict. Um, I started thinking about these, these paintings and suddenly I, I imagine this place, this olive grove at dusk, you know, the dusty, waxy leaves of the olive tree um, reminded me of the dust in the air after a bombing attack. 
And then I imagine fireflies populating this, this olive grove. And in a way, each of these fireflies to me represented the trajectory of a citizen journalist moving through the darkness or through the smoke and the clouds of debris uh, with their cell phone, trying to record and bear witness and then upload that data to the world so the world could see what was happening. Um, and I thought it was a pretty metaphor. And as, as children, when we're confronted with fireflies, our instinct is to reach out and try and capture them, capture that light. And um, that's the idea behind this project, is to immerse people in this world and get them to capture that light. And when they capture that light, then they'll hear fragments of the videos that were uploaded. I just want to close with a testimony from a citizen journalist, uh, Luai Barakat, um, reflecting on his own documentation of these events. The Al-Quds hospital massacre was the worst day for me. I was on my way to buy bread when I first heard the fighter jets above. The area hit was very close to me, so I ran home to get my camera and rushed towards the bombing. The first strike hit near the Al-Quds hospital. The plane left and then came back, and another two rockets struck directly into the hospital wall. Wherever I looked, I saw dead bodies and people burning alive. My mind went blank. The horror of the situation made me lose sight of reality and any sense of time. I only realized I was still holding my camera when the rescue team was leaving, and I had to leave with them. What makes me stay and do this work is knowing that in every revolution, there are those who take advantage of the situation and those that try to get to the top. I still have a role to play inside. There are many journalists who have gone, but there are many of us who refuse to leave. I will never leave. I do not run from any shelling because I consider myself dead, no matter what I do. So I insist on filming it. Thanks. Um, I want to invite one person from each team to come up. We have mostly the thinkers and Mate here. I would be curious to just hear a little bit about um, what surprised you in this process or what kind of new ideas emerged through the collaboration or what you're really excited about right now. So I, I think the... Um challenge uh, is the time frame and also obviously like always if you start with a very um, ambitious and uh, you know kind of diverse goals and kind of like a lot of ideas that's it's a uh, challenging to break it down to something that can work and in that regard I found the um, working with the mentors quite interesting because the feedback um, you know was was very helpful to to narrow it down to something workable for us. And, um, and yeah, that would be my perspective. I think I had two surprises. Well, the first one was within our own group. That I think that's what I said before already, that I, I was almost getting angry at Samara that she wouldn't leave us more time <laughs> to work. And then I realized that was great <laughs> because that really forced us very quickly to cut down to a simple idea um, also a little bit with help from the mentors who kind of said get it simple and that was the best we can do I think that's usually the best you can do but when you are in this creative process you kind of forget so so it's good to have this kind of to be forced from the outside and then the second surprise I had so I knew that I really liked where we're going, and then I, I always heard from other groups, oh, we just we don't really know the first few days, we don't really know where we're going, and then we heard this kind of presentations today, we, we, for, for, we had a little round of presentations already before this morning, and I realized, wow, there are really so many great ideas, and I've never expected, you know, that this would come out of here, so that was impressive for me. Yeah, I got one. Yeah. Um, I think for me the the challenge was coming at this as a you know I work as a photojournalist and we tend to work alone um, 
and we don't necessarily trust collaboration uh, as much as, as filmmakers might. Um, so, so wrapping my head around the idea that there was this incredibly creative group of people who, who saw things in a totally different way um, was first a challenge and then a delight um, because I was able to open up and reconsider things uh, from a different perspective. So it was very worthwhile for me. Uh, what was really exciting for me coming to this process is that it was a really um, great group of people. It wasn't just uh, VR creators or filmmakers or, or developers or journalists. It was kind of all of all of these people together, and we were kind of placed into these groups um, and came from really very different um, kind of backgrounds in terms of skill sets. And what was so exciting was able to kind of bounce ideas off and see those ideas ideas evolve and grow. And I think what's so important in collaborative projects, which, you know, I mean, sure, you, you can find people that can make a VR um, project entirely on their own. But um, I think what's really great is kind of working with uh, a bunch of people that really have this, uh, I think that this diversity of thought, um, you know, and when it comes to anything, kind of only can improve, uh, improve a project. And in this case, it was really exciting just to kind of share um, everybody's different ideas, um, not just within our own groups, but also with others in, in different groups. Um, and, you know, also just um, like I... I use Unity, for instance, in in my VR content, but I don't specifically design games. So having a game designer there to kind of like take these like kind of abstract ideas and then really, you know, be like, oh, well, this is how it's going to uh, be the best uh, experience for the user was was really exciting. And then having these amazing thinkers, as we're calling them, um, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was, I thought it was... <laughs> yeah, the rest of us <laughs> don't think. Some people think deeper than others. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. Um, I found it interesting that that we actually we didn't break anything down. You know, that I, I was surprised because I came with so many with so much shit. You know, um, that I thought it would be necessary to do that. And also the working process was really interesting because we did not, you know, I was walking around the room looking at what the other groups were doing and there was one group like after five minutes they had a whole story brought up on the wall and like three, seven different colored post-its and, and we did nothing of that. We basically just chatted and then we drank a little bit and then we chatted some more and and everything you saw today came up in the last like 10 minutes this morning. So this was really a nice thing. But also what I found great was to see that, that you could keep it diverse, that it wasn't necessary that we are apparently, uh, which, which is this like what I take from here, is this great medium that you can use um, to, to really create a very, very complex, diverse narrative. And to keep it that way, to not narrow it down, to not decide for one narrative line, to not decide for one discourse. And uh, because those, those always, you know, leave something out and they always, um, uh, yeah, create, you, if, you, if you create one narrative, um, you inevitably, uh, you know, uh, end up doing just one thing. That wasn't really my mind. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have questions now in the room? I'll keep going then. If you do raise your hand, there's mics going around. Was there anything that, you don't need to answer like in order, like just jump in. Uh, was there anything that you knew from the outset or that became really clear when you were brainstorming that you didn't want to do? Like, like a pathway that the project could have taken that you were like very firmly um, opposed to? Or, and is there, any way, is there anything that you'd like to discuss in that sense? <laughs> yeah. I, th I think what was great is really kind of um, that you know certain ideas kind of uh, c come out and but really the the process of kind of um, of just chatting and talking to each other we we spent a lot of time just talking about uh, themes in general without actually discussing the project and for us that was like. Um, just a really great, great process, and I and I think that um, with with VR you can kind of get stuck um, 
or actually within, within other kind of mediums, you can kind of get stuck in these like boxes and also traditions of how you explore a uh, story. And with this, you can kind of, um, with VR and interactive media in general, kind of explore different, um, uh, different ways of, of storytelling or, or, um, you know, um, kind of getting our messages across. So for us, it was, and, you know, these things kind of grow organically, I felt like. And and Charlene was not uh, a member of our group at the beginning, but it was just, you know, it felt natural to kind of, uh, her, her thoughts kind of worked well with ours. And so then it was like, okay, well, <laughs> welcome. We kind of absorbed her. So I think that it was um, really just kind of finding finding the right people, but keeping a very open mind and and allowing the projects to grow. I like, I mean, the three of your projects, the three of you on the end have like this toying with the idea of darkness. Like instead of this technology that allows you to see everything and kind of enter these new frontiers of visibility, there's actually a lot of play with what can't be seen and with kind of obscuring um, your vision. I don't know. It's just something that occurred to me now. I don't know if any of you kind of wanted to talk about that kind of as a conversation that you had within your team. I was just uh, like really fascinated with this project um, where where you're you're kind of and maybe you can comment on this was just this you had um, this source material that's almost too um, too difficult to watch but the whole point is you're you know the the reason why people were taking this footage is to try and reach reach out beyond their uh, the place that they're in and so for you and your group kind of figuring out how do you kind of get these the, the, the feeling and emotion of this um, these like tragic incidents without actually showing showing the footage well it's very it's very counterintuitive as a visual journalist to uh, reject imagery um, but that that's that's one of the interesting things that you can do in the VR space you can introduce other components that uh, that um, make people react on a ver very visceral level um, without necessarily seeing anything or without seeing what you're telling them they're seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that interesting that emerged was the relevance of Johannes, who you guys saw, um, you know, providing the soundtrack for both Liam and Christiana's presentation, and he consulted with all the teams, like the importance of sound and the complexity of how a sonic experience can be played out in VR is really like, very much underlined by the process. Okay, we've got two questions. So, Sam, go first. And then. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I'm curious about like, the problem of representing some of these images, which, which uh, are, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if it's a it is a problem, right, to, to, to pick some of these images, even though they're, they're documentary. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, and not necessarily, like, I want to ask, is it necessary to, to show these? Is it necessary to, like, connect with them? Um, or, or is there another way to communicate? I, I mean, I, I guess the part that we're working on right now is to communicate without showing the, the troubling images, but is it necessary, and how can we connect with that reality without, you know, falling apart because it is emotional and it is like brutal. It is brutal and I think that the vast majority of these types of images are going to be used um, as part of a, a body of evidence to prosecute certain state actors for war crimes somewhere down the line in the future, hopefully, maybe. Um, for the average citizen, uh, I don't know how helpful it is to see these types of horrible images all the time. In fact, it might sort of be counterproductive because the more you see, the more, the less susceptible you are to feeling something when you see them. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I guess that I, what I found also interesting in actually several of this project because you know for a while we've been talking about VR, the empathy machine, and we've seen all this projects that really want to make you empathize with everything and they put you in this uncomfortable situation and I'm coming out of this experience like, oh, I don't know why, why do I have to actually feel this? So I, I like this kind of approach of this several projects here that actually kind of make you think without necessarily making you feel totally uncomfortable, maybe a little bit, but, you know, going like finding a good balance. I think, yeah, I think people often accuse VR of being, you know, a very flashy medium. Um, 
but but I'm more interested in what you can pull out of the box, not what you can stick inside of it. Um, and I think I think that's true of many of these projects. I, I I'm really I mean as a first time I'm really a big fan of the potential of uncomfortableness um, with it. You know when you think about the deep sea, for example, it's just pressure. But also I think yeah we should we should work more on making each each other and ourselves uncomfortable through technology because this is basically how you I think it, you can learn more from that. But I think it's about a balance question because I think if there's it's too much. About balance. Yeah, everything is always about balance. No, I, I'm pretty sure there's also there's already VR torture somewhere going on. Well, this is why we need um, this meditation <laughs> afterwards. Uh, we have a question right here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. Um, I was uh, I was interested in the journalism uh, connection. Uh, to these, to these meetings, and uh, especially in Mr. Maloney's talk. Um, and um, uh, it, it occurs to me, journalism is, is inherently very time-sensitive. What's, what's today's headline is, is forgotten tomorrow. Uh, and how do, you, how do you match that with, uh, with the, all of the uh, necessary technology that's needed and, and, and uh, work that's needed to transfer something into a, a VR image and get it to, to uh, the, 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 the person in the street? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I personally think that we live in a post-24 hour news cycle world. I think that what journalists should be concerned with now is this enormous digital archive that exists that's being produced every day that nobody is looking at. There's so much content produced by people who are at the epicenter of, um, you know, natural disasters, um, conflicts, you name it, um, water crises, and they have as much to say as professional journalists do. And um, in some ways their content is more... Um, interesting and, and better informed. So, so I think we have this duty to explore that archive. Um, and whether something was recorded 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago, the volume of that information is what interests me as a, as a journalist. It certainly seems valuable, but is it journalism? That's a great question. Does I that don't know. matter? <laughs> Well, I think so. Journalism is important in the world, I, I, I think. It's, it's good to know what's going on. I think, I think that it's, it's standard practice now, though, for journalists, uh, capital J journalists, to um, use all kinds of digital forensics analysis methods to verify that the data that they're seeing, that they did not produce but that they are vetting, um, is accurate and verifiable. And I think that's becoming a really important task for journalists working in this medium. I think it's also important within journalism, and there is like this trend of VR creation that is kind of these empathy pieces. Um, and there are companies that really just focus on uh, making uh, journalistic content based on uh, things that are happening every day. Um, and I think that there is... Uh, it's just, um, you know, important to consider, you know, when you're kind of, there is a difference between kind of creating, uh, raising awareness about issues and also kind of exploiting situations um, of and crisis situations, especially when it's kind of within this framework of empathy VR, um, just as, a, as an Indigenous person who's watched a lot of empathy content uh, kind of focusing on ind indigenous communities, I find um, a lot of it can kind of start to feel a bit like, uh, almost like trauma porn, where it's, um, I've heard of people kind of being in one community and then they're like, oh, there's this crazy suicide ep epidemic happening over here. We've got to go there and get that. And it's kind of a, a situation where I'm like, ah, but really, is this the best, is this the best way to be using this and is this really creating empathy? Um, so, you know, I think that, that that is an important, you know, thing to be discussed. And I think um, we've, we've actually, there are actually studies that people who have, Watch the VRPs, the good VRPs that that's working. Actually, gonna are more interested after they start googling, they start reading all this 
really classical journalistic work um, to be more informed about something. So I think it works very well together with something that we kind of see more from classical day to day or even like in journalism. And then this VR is a new form of approaching the issues that we need to talk about. I also just want to plug the panel that will be happening at 3.30 because it's exactly about this topic. Um, we have Liam coming back and Anina Zetla from Arte and Zenka um, Keshoff, who's also here. One, it was one of the producers in one of the groups who they're going to be talking explicitly about um, the intersection of journalism and VR. Yeah. Um, and also to continue Nyla's, um, to Nyla's point, there's a great panel happening tomorrow. <laughs> um, stories we sell tomorrow morning, which is um, preceded by the anti-manifesto where we're actually going to have a, like a real debate about these issues. So please come tomorrow to the VR Salon. Do we have one last question? I think we have time for one more. It's a quiet room. I just wanted to like give, I guess I only see one mentor in front of me, like just to acknowledge the importance of mentorship. Do we want to, is there a question from the mentors or is there um, something specific that kind of, that the mentors were able to contribute like a, 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 a pearl of wisdom that you're only Did clutching? we do good? Because <laughs> you, you have to know that usually the mentors would go through and then leave the table. It's just like, <laughs> I'm going to go to the other table. So, Louis Richard? Well, just a, just, just a remark more, uh, and especially the, what Liam has achieved, the, the, the starting point where you were yesterday morning and where you are now, to me, those kinds of workshops, well, it, it could... It could be applied, but it's the more evident to, uh, for me, uh, to the Liam's group, uh, is really a, a tough thing to collaborate and to bring something together to the level of what all of the teams have, have presented today. So, cheers. <laughs> um, any final words, everybody? Uh, great. We'll stick around for the next panel, please, and hope to see you all tomorrow as well. Thanks for being here now. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>